Well, hello everybody, Pastor Joel here with you one more time for the past days with Pastor Joel. I really do need to get like a little, uh, you know, like the old news programs, like bum, 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 something. Some one of you can maybe magically make that happen. Hey, just want to say before we get going, thanks again, uh, getting a lot of positive feedback for this. And I just want to remind you, please feel free to share this content with people that have a different view of things. I'd like to engage with them as well. And uh, if you're benefiting from this content, you can like and subscribe to the channel. Again, share this uh, with lots of folks so we can get this message out as close as across the street and as far as across the world. Well, this video is part two in a little series I started the other day that's called Why We Believe What We Believe. And it's really focused on the most prominent popular teaching in terms of eschatology that affects not only eschatology, but, but it's really a whole system, a whole framework for seeing the scriptures known as dispensationalism. Um, you might hear it called the premillennial view. Sometimes it's called dispensational premillennialism or premillennial dispensationalism. Lots of syllables there. But it's the, again, the view that includes as some of its primary tenets uh, the, the rapture of the church, the millennial kingdom, which would be seen um, as a, a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ. It includes this, this coming future, a sort of demonic human composite antichrist figure that's coming and, and, and all of those things. And to be fair, there are definitely nuances within the view. But if you uh, ever watched or read any of the books, the, um, oh my goodness, the Left Behind series, I, I couldn't think of the name for a minute. That, that's what that teaching is. I'm a hugely successful book by Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, put out in 1970, sold some 30 million copies. I mean, uh, a lot of the uh, big name preachers that you hear today, um, John Hagee would be one name, and of course he's, he's a little bit older now, but um, uh, John MacArthur, he's also a little bit older. Uh, Greg Laurie, um, Jack Hibbs, there's a lot, a lot of guys, um, and they make these videos, and this is what's really challenging for those of us that have a different, a different view, whether or not you've actually come to um, to full preterism or fulfilled eschatology sort of view, um, it's just dispensationalism is, is um, just so assumed by a lot of believers that wouldn't even know the term dispensationalism, but they just believe these things because they've been told them over and over and over again by these sort of big name preachers, the movies, the books, and all of that, that it, it's really hard sometimes for people to even consider that maybe all of that isn't found in scripture, but I'm convinced that it, it's absolutely not. And so just very, very quick overview of video number one, and you should really go watch that to get some context. But I started there with some general themes of dispensationalism, um, primarily that within dispensationalism, there's a distinction, a necessary distinction for in order for that system to work of the church and the nation of Israel. That's a huge part of it. And then we looked a little bit at the rapture last time, and I just pulled up some texts, and again, you'll, you'll want to go back to that first video and look at those, um, some of the main texts that are, that are used to sort of bolster the, the modern teaching of the rapture. And if you really look at them, um, you're, you're not really going to find the type of information that would be required in order to teach the, the rapture as it's commonly taught as something yet um, in our future. And so you might want to look at that, and I'm going to move on today to the millennium. Now, I'm not going to cover everything there is about all these topics. This is more of an introduction, and you may want to go on to some further study. But the millennial kingdom, again, is another huge part of this view. And um, be before I get into some more of the details, I just want to mention that the millennium is essentially found in, in one chapter of what many would consider to be the most difficult letter in the whole Bible to interpret, that being the book of Revelation. Just to give you an example. Uh, John Calvin, now whether you happen to agree with Calvin and some of the ways he saw uh, soteriology and how salvation worked and so on, um, boy, pretty well-respected um, your name in, in biblical history, and, and many considered him one of the best Bible teachers ever, even Jacob Arminius, and you may or may not be aware of sort of the, the battle between what's called Calvinism and Arminianism, Arminianism but even Jacob, Jacob Arminianism, <laughs> Jacob Arminius uh, said that he thought Calvin was an amazing Bible teacher. The point is that, that Calvin, he wrote extensively and wrote commentary on, I, I think, every other book of the Bible except Revelation, because he said, I'm just, I'm putting it in my own words, but essentially he didn't feel comfortable uh, writing about it. So if an intellect like that uh, 
even didn't feel comfortable. We, we should pause when we've got essentially a whole system of eschatology that's largely built out of just one chapter of Revelation. That's what I'm saying. So just, just keep that in mind. And what you have to do I mean, dispensationalism is pull different verses from, from, from here and there and, and sort of put them together in ways that I just don't think works very well. But with that said, let's move a little bit into the idea of this millennial kingdom that would be a literal thousand year reign within dispensational teaching. Now I'm going to be looking down here. I'm actually taking some of this right out of a book that I haven't published yet, um, but just I'm going to try to keep my attention focused on you, but just realize I'm going to be um, looking at that and using it as a reference. So the millennium. According to dispensational teaching, before the millennium begins, there will be a seven year period called the Great Tribulation. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, many people will talk about this, the, you know, the most uh, sort of imagine uh, things getting the worst they could possibly get and then multiply that ten times and put it on steroids and we have some idea of just how awful the Great Tribulation uh, will be. Terrible, you know, more terrible than anything in the history of the world from this dispensational view. And uh, some dispensationalists believe the church will be raptured before the millennium, um, thus the pre, or I'm sorry, before the Great Tribulation, thus the pre-trib rapture. Uh, some believe the church will be uh, raptured in the middle of that, and they believe the Great Tribulation is a period of seven years. So if you're a, a mid-tribber, you'd be raptured three and a half years after the Great Tribulation started. Um, and some would say after the Great Tribulations, and something that seems to have picked up a little bit of steam recently would be what's known as the pre-wrath rapture. So saints would go through that whole period of seven years of Great Tribulation and then be raptured. Now here's something that's um, kind of kind of funny. Now it's kind of funny to me, and I've talked to other people that had the same view. When I was a dispensationalist, because that's the paradigm that I was initially taught, I thought there were three uh, different types of eschatology. <laughs> the pre-trib rapture, the mid-trib rapture, and the post-trib or pre-wrath rapture. And then I learned later that those were actually part of one system. Like, I didn't even know. You mean there's a whole other way of looking at this? Um, so pretty pretty interesting. But that's essentially the idea of how the, the rapture would work from that millennial view. And then, um, and I mentioned this in the last video, but I'll just touch on it. Um, what we might call traditional dispensationalism, some of the earlier writers on this actually saw such a distinction that after the church was raptured, they would eternally uh, stay separate from the nation of Israel, where believers would stay in, a, in eternal heaven, and then Israel would be on a literal new heavens and new earth. And, and now, in people that hold what, to what's often referred to as a uh, more progressive dispensational view don't see the distinction of uh, being quite that dramatic. Well, during this millennial period, there will be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. I just want to mention something about that. Um, there, there's a lot of a buzz about this temple that's about to be rebuilt. You know, not too long ago, there were some red heifers sent from a rancher in, in Texas. And, and you just hear these things one after the other. And, and as if just any, at any time now, you know, the, the rapture is going to take place. Well, in order for the rapture to take place, according to dispensationalism's own teaching, the temple has to be rebuilt first. So how could people be saying, I mean, even if you agree with that system, uh, that this rapture could take place at any place when the temple is not even there that's required as part of their own teaching? And you see so many similar inconsistencies within uh, this view. And just in case you don't know, there happens to be a, a mosque right at that location where people think the temple would be. And so you'd essentially have to have World War III take place in, in some way, shape, or form in order for there to even be a Jewish temple there. And some people, by the way, sadly and tragically, want that and are even sort of trying to force that to happen to to bring in this this rapture um, and that's you know some content maybe for some other videos down the road but the idea is that during this millennial kingdom the rebuilt temple would would be put up in Jerusalem once the temple is complete and again there are some nuances within the view but animal sacrifices would be reinstituted um, some dispensationalists again with the more traditionalist would, would say that those would would sort of be made for atonement again. A lot of dispensationalists would say no, but they're made sort of as, as a memorial of what Christ had already accomplished. Um, again, there's some division within dispensationalism on this. Um, some other things that are difficult to reconcile is you, how do you have glorified saints and carnal people living together in this millennium? And what about people who became Christians during the millennial kingdom? Would they then be raptured up? Um, 
how their bodies work, you know, how old will people be, and how will babies be born. There are all these things that if you really think through them, they get really difficult to explain. At any rate, after this thousand year period, um, there would be a judgment often referred to as the Great White Throne Judgment um, based on Revelation 20 or the Sheep and Goats Judgment um, in Matthew 25. And, and uh, a lot of uh, Christians would, would see those as the same event. Um, this can cause confusion too because there had already been a judgment of the righteous at Christ's second coming. But now following the millennium, a, a, th a thousand, you know, literally a thousand years later, according to this view, the wicked are judged. So you've got at least two second comings because you have a secret coming and then a, a coming after that and you've got at least two judgments. But when you read scripture, you, it, 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 you just don't come to that conclusion. Well, at this point, um, I, already, I already mentioned this, how, how the earlier dispensationalists had, after the millennial kingdom, you know, the church in, in Israel were separated eternally. Most don't see it that way um, these days. Um, well, I already mentioned earlier why I left behind, see what I did there, the, the rapture teaching. As it's commonly taught, I, I should mention, and you may or may not be aware of this, and, and I personally have not um, done enough study on this um, to, to speak about it too intelligently, and so I, I won't, but I do, do just want to mention that with, even within the preterist community, there are some who hold to a literal rapture, but that would have taken place you know, in that time, most would have placed it around 66 AD somewhere, um, and other preterists don't believe that was a literal event. So just realize when I'm talking about the dispensational rapture, I'm talking about as it's as it's taught in in modern in modern times. Okay, but I left behind that teaching, and then I had to abandon not only the the modern day rapture teaching, but the whole entire system. Um, so this is where you want to get your Bibles out, and we're going to look at some scripture here. This first passage is rather lengthy. But it is so important, and I get a little passionate about this because I love God's Word so much, and these particular scriptures we're going to look at um, make it so abundantly clear to me that this dispensational system is not only an error, uh, but actually an, an egregious error. And again, I, I want to be sure I'm, I'm distinguishing dispensational teaching and people who happen to be dispensationalists because I know many wonderful, wonderful believers who hold to this paradigm um, who do wonderful things for the kingdom of God even, even though according to their paradigm the kingdom isn't really here and that's where there's all this confusion but just realize that um, I'm, I'm talking about people who, who teach this who in some cases I, are, you know, are very sincere in some cases if they're authors particularly that have written books about events that haven't taken place and they keep writing books, and they keep doing videos, and keep talking about this, at, at that point it's kind of a shame on them because they know what they're teaching is false, and they keep doing it for just the almighty dollar. And that's where it gets so egregious and leads so many people astray, and it's just plain wrong with a capital wrong. So let's look at this first passage, again, kind of lengthy, but I really need you to hang with me because it's so important. This is Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 18, and I want you to listen very carefully. Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 18. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its new commands and regulations. Now listen very carefully. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. 
I absolutely love God's Word. That is such a beautiful, if not breathtaking, passage of Scripture. Now let me just point out some things that we saw. Just listing some phrases right out of those verses. Again, I'm not giving any of my own opinion. I'm not giving any kind of interpretation at this point. I'm just pulling phrases directly out of that text. Formerly, you who were Gentiles, excluded from citizenship in Israel, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, can I still say that? I did. I don't know how I missed this for years, but I did. It's amazing how much my presuppositions affected my reading of the Bible. Presuppositions being things I brought to the text, things pastors had said, things I had read, uh, denominations I'd been a part of, all these things that I assumed were right out of Scripture. And some some of them were. But many of them were not. I'm so grateful that God was patient with me. I had to repent of some of those things. And that He gave me a hunger for His Word. But again, all those presuppositions I brought to the text, and we all have them, really affected my ability to understand some of what the Bible was saying. But as I, as I continued to read and study, it became apparent that the bringing together of the Jews and Gentiles was a huge mega theme laced all throughout the New Testament. And I also came to realize that there were no passages, at least none I've found thus far, that indicated that Jews and Gentiles would ever be separated again in the future. Why is that so important? Because dispensational teaching demands that God still has a separate plan for national Israel Jews of today and believing Gentiles, the church today, dispensational teaching essentially unwinds what God put together as one new humanity. If people want to argue with this, please, please realize that they're not arguing with me. They're not arguing with you. They're arguing with Paul. They're arguing with the inspiration of Scripture. They're arguing with Yahweh himself who's explaining through Paul what Christ had accomplished. This is a big, big deal. Now, please bear with me because this video may just be, I've been trying to keep them around 18, 20 minutes, sometimes up to 25. I, I don't want to break this off at this point. I want to hit these other Scriptures. So important. Uh, this is Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 and then verse 15. Colossians 3 verses 10 and 11 and 15. Since you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek, Gentile, nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all in all. Verse 15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body. Be thankful. Paul's talking about the same thing there. Moving on to Galatians. Again, bear with me. This is too important not to have your full attention. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, try to wrap this. It's hard to wrap this up. Um, but I need to share one more scripture that's so, so very powerful. I remember the first time, this was many years ago now, long before I came into this particular understanding of eschatology, but this just hit me like a ton of bricks. 
1 Peter 2, verses 8 and 9, Peter is addressing believers. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. And what you may or may not realize, is so good, is that Moses had used essentially identical language in Exodus to speak of Yahweh's understanding of Israel. At that time, no doubt, at that time, his chosen people, you see it over and over and over in, in a lot of the, um, especially in, in, in Deuteronomy, Exodus, other places, that Yahweh was Israel's God and Israel was Yahweh's people. So no doubt, at that time, Ethnic Israel were God's chosen people in a way that no other nation on the earth was. No question. But today, no way. No way. It's an absolutely an, an egregious error, an affront, I believe, blasphemy to say that today. Because look at the scriptures we just read and what happened. And we know that again, mega theme where, where Israel was, many of them, we're going to abandon God, but God was going to use that to bring the Gentiles in and then was going to completely demolish the wall of hostility, bringing them together as one new humanity in Christ. And Peter takes the same language that Moses had applied to ancient ethnic Israel and applies it to the church, that you are now God's chosen people. You are now the holy nation. You one time had not obtained mercy, but you have obtained mercy now. Glory to God. And so, let me put all this together. You can bear, bear with me. This is so important. God's plan from all eternity was to send Christ to reconcile all things to himself so that everyone who believes would become one in Christ. All of the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament itself looked forward to and was fulfilled in Christ. The entire point of the law was to show the Israelites they were hopeless in their own efforts to follow it. The purposes of the animal sacrifices were to show that the blood of bulls and goats actually could never take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. The priests all failed because they themselves were sinners and because they died. Hebrews 10.9, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. All of this being the case, then to quote an old Beatles song, won't you please, please help me. Help me to understand why would it be a good thing to go back to a lesser covenant? Why would it be a good thing to resurrect the Mosaic law, which no one was able to wholly follow? Why would it be a good thing to bring back the animal sacrificial system of bulls and goats when Jesus, the perfect lamb, made a once and for all sacrifice already? Why would we desire to have incompetent, sinful priests rather than the perfect high priest, Jesus himself? Why would we embrace a religious system that takes God's beautiful tapestry of one people made up of believing Jews and Gentiles and unravel it again? Can someone tell me? Does it make any sense whatsoever that the one will become two and yet that's exactly what happens in dispensational teaching? Pardon me if I'm meddling. But if your great hope, you that might be listening, or, or you that have a different understanding and you're presenting that, this to other people, you might ask them this and do it as lovingly as you can. But if your great hope is the rapture of the church, if your great hope is the millennial kingdom, or if your great hope is the prospect of seeing a rebuilt temple whereby God reboots his plan to work exclusively with the nation of Israel, Aren't you essentially longing to go back into slavery under the Mosaic law? And, and how unconscionable that after Jesus has accomplished this once and all for sacrifice, for that we would even entertain the possibility of animal sacrifices. Something so gross in light of what Christ has accomplished. And I would humbly ask you, I would beg you to reconsider. We have a better covenant, a better high priest, a better temple, us, which Christ and the apostles were the foundation of that temple. And is now made up of all believers. Jesus is our hope. Not some future coming event, not a rapture, not a millennial kingdom, not an antichrist. It's amazing what's 
how ignorant people are about what the scriptures actually say and do not say about Antichrist. If that's our hope, we have completely perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've put the Bible in reverse, and in many ways it's going to keep going backwards into, you know, into the land of weeds and no return. That's how important this is. Jesus is our hope. Being in his presence is our hope. Heaven is our hope. It's not what he provides or some events that should cause our hearts to leap for joy. It is he himself. And because, yes, Jesus is good, so good, he does give us all things. He gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1. But it is he whom we worship. It is he in whom we live, move, and have our being. Christ alone, it is Christ. Then why would we ever wish to go back to something old, outdated, and dead? Do those words sound too strong in terms of the old covenant? Old, outdated, and dead? All I'm doing is quoting the author of Hebrews. But to hear more about that, you'll have to come back for part three of why we believe what we believe. Pastor Joel saying, bye for now.